The date is April 1st, 2088. One year ago to the day the United States landed its first colony constructor rocket on the surface of the moon. As a supply rocket, designated Luna 19 approaches the colony. Its engines fail, and the rocket collides with the ground at over 100 miles an hour, two kilometers from the colony. Three days later, when rescue and relief teams finally arrive, there would be no survivors. Little did the American colonists know, but these would be the first deaths in humanity's first conflict to take place beyond Earth's atmosphere. It has now been four months since President Amanda Clark was informed of Lunar 19's tragic fate on the surface of Luna, and she has just been informed of another development that worries the President. A rocket launched from Russia three months ago, advertised as a satellite launch, had just been spotted on Luna, surrounded by a fully established colony. Soon after, the British make landfall on Luna, with astronaut Mark Shepard being the first Brit to ever step foot on Earth's moon. Within a month, a British colony had been established on Luna, directly opposite the Russian colony. Now, it was Russian President Viktor Igor's turn to be worried. As their colony now found itself surrounded on two sides by the Americans and the British. In response to this, President Igor insisted to the British Prime Minister that they move the colony to be closer to the Americans, because, after all, wouldn't it make sense for the two allies to establish colonies much closer together? However, British Prime Minister Henry Robinson was not known for his patience or diligence when it came to foreign policy. His response was straight and to the point, sending back a simple, no, and if you could see me, I would flip you the bird. Instead, Prime Minister Robinson expanded the colony further towards the Russian one. Again, President Igor demanded that he stop, or it would be war. In response, the Americans expanded their colony further and shipped up specially designed rockets that would work in lower gravity. And with that, the Lunar War had begun. The next day, President Igor sent a spare supply rocket filled with space train fighting forces up to the surface of Luna, with the Russian lunar colony declaring a lunar war against the American and British colonies. Mere hours later, President Igor addressed the United Nations. This is not a war that Russia wanted to fight. However, the continued aggressive expansion of British and American forces is something that we cannot ignore. However, this war is over Luna, and should be kept that way. In that regard, Russian forces will only make aggressive moves outside of Earth's orbit. Any military action taken from within Earth's orbit, such as launching a missile, targeting a Russian rocket or facility, either within Earth's orbit or outside of it, will be considered an escalation that will require Russia to fight this war on Earth as well as Luna. The Americans and the British were stunned. Both outplayed. A specially trained Russian soldiers began to march towards the American colony. Both nations hardly attempted to train their forces and construct additional rockets to transport their forces to Luna's surface. It was the British who got ground troops onto Luna first, with B Squadron of the SAS making landfall on Luna on January 10th, 2089 as the siege of the Russian colony was just gearing up. Eighteen months later, the siege of the Russian colony was still ongoing. By this point, it was World War III in everything but name. NATO had scrambled to train troops and deploy them to what was now called Habitation Zones Alpha and Gamma, with Beta Hab being under Russian control. The war was going nowhere. NATO troops were assault, and they would be repelled by Russia. Russia would counter, and would be forced back by NATO. And this pattern would continue for 18 grueling months. Meanwhile back on Earth, a young Royal Navy engineer named Douglas Campbell approached the Admiralty with an idea, seeing as they can't launch a missile to intercept the desperately needed Russian supply rockets to keeping the Russian forces on Luna in the fight without dragging Earth into the war. Then they simply needed a way to launch the missiles from outside of Earth's atmosphere. The Admiralty simply laughed. Who was this 20-year-old boy to think they hadn't thought of satellite-based missiles? In fact, it had been a plan drawn up in the very first week of the war, but with no easy way to rearm the satellites, it was just inviting the Russians to do the same. What this mere boy was suggesting was something quite different. 
a spacefaring destroyer capable of re-entering Earth's atmosphere, rearming before heading back to space to continue the fight. Presenting plans, the Admiralty loved it, and work began straight away on the construction of the United Kingdom's, and indeed humanity's, first space naval ship. December 16th, 2092. Six soldiers of the SAS's B Squadron, led by Master Sergeant Don Scott, slipped into Beta Hab at the dead of night, deploying a pressurized temporary staging tent outside of the Hab before sealing it to Beta Hab's wall. The soldiers took out their cutting tools, slicing a hole into the side of the pressurized exterior. They were in. Russian General Anastasia Petrov sat at her desk on the observation deck of the Hab, looking out over Luna's surface poring over battle plans of an upcoming offensive supposed to puncture a hole into British-held Gamma Hab. Suddenly, the door opened. I told you not to disturb me. General Petrov slumps over in her chair, as the soldiers of B Squadron silently move into the room. The general's body falls hard to the floor with a loud thud. All the SAS soldiers freeze. Did someone hear that? Asked the youngest member of the team, 24-year-old Sergeant Adam Robinson, son to the Prime Minister. Scott barely had time to open his mouth before Robinson was peppered with bullets as Russian soldiers charged in from the elevator. Scott took a shot to the arm while retreating back into the general's quarters as the rest of B Squadron sealed the doors behind him. They sealed their spacesuits as they turned to Scott solemnly, air clearly leaking from his shoulder wound. With a single nod, Scott opened the door back out into the corridor as he began to sing Old Line Zine as the rest of B Squad broke through the observation glass and shot out into the vacuum of Luna. They heard the tune falter, and then completely stop, as the entire observation deck exploded. Massive Sergeant Don Scott would be posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions, and with General Petrov dead, the Russian outer defences collapsed, forcing them to withdraw back to their final defensive lines. After the loss of his son in an operation he had pushed for, Prime Minister Henry Robinson resolved to win the war. And besides, his secret weapon, which had been kept completely secret, even from his NATO allies, was soon to be launched. President Amanda Clark sat at her desk in horror. She stared at Henry Robinson in complete disgust. No, that wasn't it. Fear. Robinson had just finished informing her that Britain would be launching a space-capable destroyer by the end of the month, and to ensure that no word of this reached President Igor, it had been kept completely quiet even from Britain's most trusted allies. However, now Robinson brought with him a complete copy of all the plans and schematics for not only the destroyer, but for the newly invented artificial gravity generator, invented by Scottish engineer Jack Morrison. President Clark, for the first time in her long political career, didn't know what to say. However, she did know what to do. As soon as Prime Minister Robinson had left the Oval Office, she was on the phone with her admirals, passing along schematics and data with orders to begin designing of America's own space vessel. February 28th, 2093. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition is go. From a remote location in the Scottish Highlands, which was now teeming with news reporters, awestruck citizens, and undoubtedly not a small number of spies, the HMS Hood, the first of the Royal Navy's Campbell-class destroyers, launched from its silo and climbed for high Earth orbit. Equipped with the Royal Navy's best and brightest, and capable of remaining in space without resupply for seven years, as Douglas Campbell marveled at the ship, he was stabbed in the back by an assassin. Douglas Campbell, the world's first starship designer and engineer, was dead. His daughter, Natalie Campbell, held her father as his eyes shut for the final time. The assassin had managed to slip away within the crowd. The police had tackled the wrong man. As the HMS Hood climbed high into and beyond Earth's orbit, it set its sights on the primary target. The target that the destroyer's launch had been purposely coincided with, the vital Russian food and weapons supply rocket. HMS Hood thundered towards the rocket. As soon as the destroyer was clear of Earth's orbit, she fired. The Hood didn't miss. The Russian rocket exploded. President Igor cursed. For the next year, the HMS Hood dominated the space between Earth and Luna, shooting down any Russian supply rocket that attempted to make it close to Luna's surface, as well as assisting in supporting ground assets by providing fire support from low lunar orbit. On the 3rd of July, 2094, America launched its own space destroyer, 
the USS Enterprise. Heavily based on the Campbell class, it had been modified close to the point it was unrecognizable as the same ship, dubbed the Enterprise class. On November 19th of the same year, HMS Valiant was launched by Britain, another Campbell class. The Lunar War looked like it was over, until it all changed. On March 21st, 2095, Russia launched the RFP Vladivostok, a light cruiser-sized ship. Allied intelligence had dropped the ball. The construction of this ship had gone completely unnoticed for two years. The Vladivostok marked its arrival onto the new naval battlefield in the same way the Hood had done all those years ago, by destroying a supply rocket inbound for Luna. However, by a stroke of misfortune for the United States, the USS Enterprise found herself only a few kilometers out of the believed range of the Vladivostok's guns. And to make matters worse, despite being a larger ship, Vladivostok had a higher acceleration than both British and American destroyers. Captain Anna Harita made a desperate call for help to HMS Hood and Valiant. However, even at top speed, the two British destroyers were still 20 hours away. The Vladivostok would be in range of Enterprise within only 19. But with little choice, Captain Harata banked Enterprise hard and raced towards Luna and the British destroyers, with Vladivostok hot on her tail. 19 hours into the pursuit, Enterprise had been burning fuel at too too fast a rate. Even if it survived the battle to come, if it continued on like this, the ship would be left adrift and out of fuel. With no options left to her, Captain Harata sent a message to HMS Hood. Enterprise is running out of fuel. Am engaging. Please make all efforts to return our bodies to Earth. Godspeed. Enterprise came hard about, as some of her crew came close to blacking out, before charging headlong at the RFS Vladivostok. Taken by surprise at this suicidal charge, the Vladivostok banks hard to the side, its primary cannon's aim being thrown off and flying violently to the side, completely missing the Enterprise. However, this victory was not to last, as Vladivostok was a superior ship in the end. It fired its broadside guns into Enterprise. Shearing off the destroyer's nose, getting to her feet, Captain Harata ordered abandoned ship, as Enterprise was now dead in the water. The hulking form of the Vladivostok loomed into view out of the window. If it was asking for a surrender, Captain Harata would never know. Communication hooray had been attached to the nose. Suddenly, trails of smoke flew across the vastness of space as five torpedoes crashed into the Vladivostok's side, ripping the hull asunder and knocking some of the light cruiser's thrusters and weapons offline. The forgiving shape of the HMS Hood soared in front of the Enterprise. Captain Oscar Thomas had pushed the ship to such great speeds that part of her armor belt had come apart or buckled. The Vladivostok began to back off. However, Captain Thomas wasn't going to let the ship get away that easily. Ordering another volley to be loaded, the HMS Hood fired its missiles again, this time striking the main engines of the Vladivostok, leaving the ship slowly drifting towards Earth. A Russian medical rocket would be along to recover the crew in a day or two. Until then, Hood has sustained critical damage to its armor belt and its incredibly high-speed push to reach Enterprise on time, attaching its grappler cables to the Enterprise and beginning to tow it back towards Earth. Two days later, Russia would surrender. It would be allowed to keep its lunar colony to prevent further political unrest. However, no military troops would be allowed to set foot on the surface of Luna, and the Vladivostok would need to stay in dry dock on Earth. And, as the Lunar War finally ended, humanity had taken its first steps into the greater colonization of the stars. However, if they thought that these would be the end of their problems, they were sorely mistaken.